And at family gatherings and pool parties, they were given like Apollo and Kenya, you know, throwing each other in the pool, doing too much. Yeah, that kind of vibe. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Kennedy. If you're new here, if you're not new, hey girl, how have you been? Welcome back to another true crime and makeup video here on the channel. This case is gonna make you so mad. Warnings in advance. Um, also, for the last video, I'm glad y'all enjoyed like the women on death row situation. We're never doing that again because <laughs> Just because of the subject matter, it was originally 30 plus minutes long, but I had to upload it like three times and it kept getting flagged for the subject matter. And one thing like about YouTube is when your video gets flagged for being too like gruesome or whatever, it doesn't really tell you like what section of the video it is. Like if you get a copyright strike for like music or something like that, or like having a clip of a show, like when we do True Crime TV, it'll tell me, hey, this is what you need to take out for like just overall gruesome things. I guess um, it doesn't really tell it doesn't tell you at all exactly what it is about the video that needs to come down you know so I have to play with that a little bit so I don't know if we're ever gonna be able to do that again but it was fun <laughs> but we can go ahead and hop into today's case make sure you subscribe before you leave before we hop in all right guys so we're gonna hop into today's case the tragedy of today's case takes place July 9th 1998 but we're gonna take it back and give y'all a little bit of backstory before we get into the BS. So today's case revolves around Tammy and Arnold Kyler. Tammy and Arnold met in the mid 80s when they were both in college. Tammy was studying psychology at St. Joseph's University. We're in Connecticut, by the way. And Arnold was studying English at the University of Connecticut. They met at a club one night and their relationship blossomed from there. Eventually the two would settle down into a committed relationship and move in together. But Arnold was always somewhat of a ladies man. He was attractive, he had a great job. He had a lot going for himself and while he wasn't necessarily super pressed behind the relationship, Tammy was. And because of this, early on, she put up with a lot. There was a lot of infidelity early on in the relationship that Tammy kind of swept under the rug. And after meeting in about 1985 and not having the best relationship, Tammy put up with a little bit more than she should have had to, especially with a fresh new situation. By 1989, the couple was living together and they end up pregnant. And they have a baby, their first and only son, Jarrell, in October of 1990. And of course, the couple rushed to get married before the baby was born, as often, you know, happened back in the 80s and 90s. And hell, still today, why is y'all getting married just because y'all knocked up? Let that go. Let that go. Let's let that go. That child is better off a bastard if y'all gonna be fighting every day, okay? Don't let your husband get in the way of finding that baby a stepdad. Anyway, after getting married and welcoming the baby, they moved to Windsor, Connecticut, where they have family and just a little bit more of a support system. So they're living in Windsor, Connecticut. They also become Jehovah's Witnesses, which isn't unfamiliar to them. Tammy had people in her family who were also Jehovah Witnesses. So they're living as a family. They've got new faith, a new baby, and things are steady. And one of the family members, Tammy and her family, her new little family grew closest to after moving to Windsor, Connecticut was, I almost said, Cousin Faith. And if you know where that's taking us, yeah, we're going there. She's a Cousin Faith, but her name is Chastity. If you don't know what a Cousin Faith is, watch Soul Food. It's damn near a Christmas movie. If you haven't seen Soul Food, you need to watch it. So watch Soul Food. That's, that's, take that away from this. <laughs> and Cousin Chastity plays a big role in the household because they're both working full time. Tammy is a full time social worker. Arnold has his own big boy job as well. And Cousin Chastity is a little bit younger, so she's able to help out with Jarrell who is two years old by this time in 1992. 
when things start to get a little weird. And when I say things start to get weird, this is what I mean. So Cousin Chastity seemed to be pushing up on Arnold. And it seemed to be something that the other family members were noticing, but Tammy was kind of turning a blind eye to. And y'all know when kids are young, you know, 21, 22, like they, you think you're doing stuff in secret, but you're really not. Like, you know, you can tell when somebody that young is really smitten with somebody, you know, they kind of wear it on their sleeve. It's hard for them to hide if they choose to hide it at all. But Cousin Chastity seemed to be pushing up on Arnold. It seemed to be while, as she was just there to help with baby Jarrell at first, she started using him as an excuse to be around Arnold. Using the baby to just like be in the mix. But you know, they just move along. Uh, nothing too extreme happens. And Timmy just tells everybody, you know, who's kind of turning their nose up, looking to the side. Y'all know how black people do. It just didn't feel right. Tammy was like, no, you know, y'all are overreacting. It's fine, da 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 And she kind of just turns a blind eye to it. And in 1994, she has her second child with Arnold, a daughter whose name is Lindsay. And the family didn't really start to be concerned until it seemed as though Arnold was like recipro recipro reciprocating the energy that little young, well not little, but younger chastity was putting out. And at family functions, it seemed like they were just really into each other blatantly at that. And at family gatherings and pool parties, they were given like Apollo and Kenya, you know, throwing each other in the pool, doing too much. Yeah, that kind of vibe. And family, you know, who was already concerned just started to get more and more suspicious. And remember, this is all family, okay? Chastity is cousin Chastity. This is Tammy's first cousin at that, okay? The kind of straw that broke the camel's back was one night, Chastity, her brother, Arnold, and some other people had all went out for like a night of drinking, bar hopping, that type of thing. But Chastity and Arnold got back way later than they were supposed to, way later than everybody else. And they said it was because Chastity had lost her ID and they had kind of been going back and forth to all of the bars that they had frequented that night trying to find her ID, just her and Arnold. And this is what ignited like the full blown affair rumors in the family. Everybody was like, mm -mm, this ain't it, this ain't right, something is going on. Because like I said, Chastity and Tammy were first cousins, their mothers were sisters, it started to drive a huge wedge between the families. And remember all of this is happening fresh off of Tammy having her second child with Arnold. And I don't wanna feel like everything in life, cause we always talk about me working at Hooters. Not everything in life revolves back to me working at Hooters, but I learned a lot about men working at Hooters and I feel like Hooters is a place for men who are either like testing the waters on stepping out on their wives or who want to like flirt but don't wanna cheat. Like it's that middle ground, you know what I'm saying? And I've like met a lot of cheaters or like potential cheaters, like men trying to test the waters type shit. And it's just something about men who have, and not all of them, not all men who go to Hooters are like that. Some of them are very much regular and just are trying to eat a 10 piece hot with ranch, you know, type shit. But um, some of them aren't. And I've met so many men who like, are just like, I don't wanna say disgusted, but like after their wives have kids, like something about their wife, the wife doesn't change aside to the fact that she's become a mother, but for some reason, for some men, like watching their wives become mothers, like does something to them. It makes them unattractive to them. I don't know if it's like a crisis type thing, but some men just like hate their wives after their wives have children. And I don't know why, I don't know what the psychology behind that is, but I've seen that so many times and I feel like it's either one way or the other like after the wife has kids either the respect the love the admiration like goes to the roof for the husband after watching the wife have kids or it's the total opposite like they just can't stand her and I don't know why and do y'all like I know we're mostly women here do y'all feel that like have y'all witnessed that before 
am I crazy? Like y'all know what I'm talking about, right? It's like after their wives have the babies, they either turn into the like best man ever or the worst man ever. And I don't know like what happens. Like why does that happen? But you know, time goes on. Little instances, if you want to call them little, they occur, but it seems as though Tammy is really interested in keeping her family together and pushing things to the wayside. Y'all know divorce is really fond of, frowned upon in most religions, but in the Jehovah's Witness faith as well. So she's really trying to keep it together, okay? But it's just like the little things that just keep going wrong. Like I said, the whole pool party fiasco them going to the club coming back super late after everybody else and then it seems like you know they just get to be more blatant family and friends discuss a time where after baby Lindsay had gotten a little bit older cousin chastity had her in her lap and they were all sitting around the pool and they were in their bathing suits that kind of thing and cousin chastity had on a bikini and baby Lindsay kept grabbing on the bikini and exposing cousin chastity's boobies okay and the people at this little get together whatever said they felt like it was being done on purpose like the first time was an accident but when chastity saw it happen and she saw that arnold was watching she let it happen again and again and again things would eventually get so crazy sammy would virtually end up as a single mother of three kids okay so let's get into it so going into 1996, Tammy welcomes another child into her home, her nephew, Danny Jr. Remember I told you guys Tammy is a social worker and Danny Jr., her nephew, almost slipped into the system. There was like some alcohol abuse going on in the home with Tammy's brother and his girlfriend, the mother of the child. That led to some neglect and an and obviously, instead of letting her nephew slip into the system, she welcomed him into her home. So having a third child in the household is already strain enough on their marriage, on top of an already stressful situation with cousin Chassie. Then, on top of all of that, there was a family function where allegedly Arnold and Chassie were caught having relations. Okay. Apparently the person who caught them like didn't make it a big scene, didn't tell anybody, like it wasn't like a, ah, I got you and like running all through the house with a knife like soul food. No, it wasn't that. Um, the cousin just relayed this information to Tammy. This was enough for Tammy and she calls off the relationship. Arnold moves out and now she is alone in her home with three kids, okay? So during and after the divorce, Chastity and Arnold, they continued their relationship, not like publicly blatantly, but it wasn't like a secret either. You know what I mean? Everybody knew what was going on. And Tammy goes out and does the damn thing, okay? Stable in her career, she buys her first home just a year after the, 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 the divorce. She's doing great. She's got her three babies under one roof and she's doing her. And she starts seeing another man. This man's name is Benjamin. But it seems like Tammy just has a bad picker. You know how people say that? Because Benjamin was a piece of work too. He was acting funny and in and out of the house in the middle of the night. He also made the kids kind of uncomfortable. And eventually Tammy found out that Benjamin was married. He's also Jamaican and claimed to be like in some Jamaican gang. He was just making everybody uncomfortable. So she gets rid of him too. This brings us to the night of July 9th, 1998. She is man free and just home with the kids. When in the middle of the night at about 1 a.m. There is an attack on the family. It's a rainy thunderstormy like middle of the night type situation the kids come and climb into bed with Tammy because they're scared of like the thunder and the lightning and by 4 a.m. that morning police will be called out to a very gruesome bloody crime scene Tammy had called 911 and she was screaming on the phone saying that they killed my baby they killed my baby massive trigger warning the child that she is referring to is her oldest son, Jarrell, he does not survive and it is heavy, okay? But here we go. So Tammy says that she woke up in the middle of the night by like a sound, a feeling, just disarray in her household. Y'all know like that 
instinct and she goes to check on things make sure all the doors are closed shit like that and she is attacked by a masked person um this masked person pins her down to the ground covers her mouth and while she is on the floor downstairs another person goes upstairs to where the children are but remember i said they climbed into bed with tammy that night on the first floor so the masked person while tammy is still pinned down on the ground comes back from downstairs and heads into Tammy's bedroom, okay? And from her bedroom, she can hear her children screaming. Once her kids start screaming this like, you know, I don't know, what is that? Adrenaline rouse up in her. She's able to pull her, she's able to free her mouth from this person who's got her pinned down and start screaming for her kids. And apparently, when this person who was putting her down realizes that, that realizes that there's kids involved, they yell out, I'm out, I'm done, I'm out. And they get up and run out of the home. And so the second person who was in the bedroom with the children leaves shortly after. Like once they realize they don't have their accomplice, they jet out the door. I'm sparing you the gruesome details. Jarrell and baby Lindsay were both attacked. Jarrell at this time would be seven, Lindsay is two. They were both attacked. Lindsay, not as bad as Jarrell, but um, Jarrell, as a result of this attack at 70 years old, passes away at the hospital. And Danny Jr. is left unharmed, okay? And this is obviously devastating for everybody involved, devastating for the whole family, devastating for officers handling the case, and it is obviously all hands on deck immediately they waste no time they want to figure out who did this as absolutely soon as possible so obviously they want to take a look at their crime scene it's absolutely brutal very bloody there's blood everywhere because of the nature of the crime and there's also gasoline all over the home and there was like a makeshift like molotov co cocktail found at tammy's bedside okay Somebody had probably come in here to just kill everybody in the home. Then probably had the intentions of setting the house on fire. But when the second party involved realized that this was something they didn't want to be involved in, obviously the other person left as well. They fled before they finished doing what they had probably come there to do, which is kill everybody in the home and then light the house on fire. Obviously the first suspect in question is going to be Arnold, her ex-husband but he is ruled out almost immediately because he was at home and Tammy called him immediately after she called 911 to let him know what happened like in a panic she called him and he was too far away he didn't live close enough to have been able to do the attack and then be at home to answer the phone for Tammy's phone call afterwards if that makes sense like he wouldn't have been home to answer the phone if he was also at her house committing the attack the next person on the list was Benjamin because like I said, he had some shady dealings going on. He was married and he also had, like I said, the Jamaican gang allegations or whatever. Now this was important to detectives because remember I said the Molotov cocktail that was left beside her bed, it was a pineapple soda. And that's specific to detectives because there was a Jamaican gang related double homicide that had happened a little while before this happened. And those people were brutalized in a similar fashion and a similar pineapple soda Molotov cocktail was also found at the scene, okay? So even if Benjamin wasn't directly involved, they wonder if this was like a murder for hire situation, like a hit that was put out on the family. But eventually Benjamin is ruled out as well. And what detectives decide to do just to knock people off the list, they don't want this case to go cold. They don't wanna play no games. They decide to ask Tammy to come in for a polygraph test but they don't think that she would pass it because of the state of mind that she's in so soon after this happened to her son they you know they figured it would be inconclusive because of her state of mind her physical state her anxiety after losing her child this way it just wouldn't work but they didn't want to see if she would pass or fail they just wanted to see if she would be willing to take it like if she was shifty if she was hiding something if she didn't want to take the test but tammy agreed to take the polygraph test and she did it was inconclusive the way they thought but they were just happy to know that she was willing to do so they felt like if she was hiding something that she would have not agreed to take a polygraph test then their next course of action is to focus in on the person who like pulled out of this crime 
in the middle of it, okay? The person who had Tammy pinned down on the ground. Now in this struggle, this masked man had a watch on, a little like athletic G-Shock style, style watch that Tammy had pulled off in the struggle. And so since this watch was left at the crime scene, they decided to do like a press conference. And in this press conference, they said that they had DNA from the band of the watch that was recovered and that they were gonna move forward with testing this DNA to identify their suspect, even though this was not true. But they did this knowing that whoever had done this had some type of guilt, some type of conscience because they walked out in the middle. Like whatever they were told they were going there to do was not what they were going there to do originally. They didn't know there were gonna be kids involved seemingly. You know, they were disgusted mid act. So this person probably was ready to come talk with a little bit of nudging, you know? And this does work. The day after the press conference, they get a call from an attorney representing a man who says he was the one who was there that night. And his name is Miguel Vasquez, says that, you know, he was there. Not only was he there, but he was paid to be there. Miguel says that, yes, that is exactly what happened. He was paid $4,000 to be there as like a strong arm, strong man. But when he heard children screaming, children being attacked, he gave the person that he was there with a weapon, like a big, like, you know, like a box cutter, but they use it to cut carpet. So it's like a big ass version of a box cutter. He knew he had armed the person with him with that. Once he heard the children being terrorized, he bounced. And he says it was never supposed to be that. He was there just like for robbery and they were supposed to quote unquote, fuck up the house. And Miguel Vasquez says he was paid and sequestered by Chastity West. So obviously after this, they scoop up Chastity super quick, bring her in and they set her up. They have autopsy photos of Jarrell on the table to really, you know, pull at her, I would say pull at her heartstrings, but She's the one who did it, so. But yeah, she breaks down after seeing the autopsy photos of Jarrell and confesses to the murders. And she had done this after running off with this lady's husband. You already got what you wanted. You got the husband. But just being in a relationship with Jarrell, not with Jarrell, I'm sorry. But just being in a relationship with Arnold for Chastity was not enough. She didn't like the scrutiny that her relationship was under because she was sleeping with and got into a relationship with her cousins, her first cousin's husband. So she wanted to move away to Georgia with Arnold so they could start and kind of like live their life out loud and like have a normal relationship without like the eyes of everybody in the community, you know, everybody who knew the situation on them. But Arnold was never willing to move because he didn't want to move away from his children. And so that's when Chastity cooked up this plan so that Arnold would be free from his kids and the things that tied him down in Connecticut and they could move on in a different state. They both take guilty pleas and plea out. Miguel Vasquez is at first sentenced to 25 years for his involvement. Later his sentence is reduced to just six years which probably has something to do with the fact that he was very young. He was only 18 at the time of all of this, way in over his head. Chastity West is sentenced to 999 years in prison, missing the death penalty with her guilty plea. But yeah, that's where this case leaves off. Apparently from a comment I read on a YouTube video about the case, Chastity is living a great life in prison, as great as it can be, you know? She's well liked and she in there chilling. Three hots and a cop. I will never go to prison, amen. Knock on wood, amen, I will never go to prison. But that's what I hear a lot of people say is that, you know, once you get used to being in there, it's not all that bad. Nothing, nothing beats living on the outside, but once they get in there and they ain't getting out, they be chilling. But that is a wrap on today's case. Um, sorry I pissed you off. I know this one pisses you off because it pisses me off very much so just like i just have no words over a man y'all know how i feel about people doing stuff over a man mm. Ooh, i'm sorry i just yawned y'all the weather changing makes me so sleepy the sun is never out i just want to sleep all day and all night 
But that is a wrap on today's case. If this was your first time here, make sure you subscribe before you leave, and I'll see you next time. Bye, guys. This is the story that I... I have one that's much worse for you. I grew up in Southern California next to the border, and this is a crazy story that happened to someone that I know. Picture this, you're a guy, you finally found a girl that you wanna settle down with and be with forever. You're extremely happy with her. You go on a trip with her and some of your friends to Mexico, okay? You're at a bar, things are going great, tequila's flowing, mariachi music's playing, you're having tacos or whatever, and everything's great, okay? You guys, you're busy talking to your friends and her friends are busy or whatever, so she goes to the bathroom. You don't really hear from her, um, for a few minutes so you go look and she's not there and you can't find her you spend the next couple days searching because you can't find her anywhere in mexico and you're panicking you're freaking out but your trip's over you have to come back you've alerted authorities there's nothing that anyone can do at the moment she's gone the girl that you thought didn't exist who's so perfect for you is gone so you're in line at the border trying to get back into the united states and there's traffic and you look over at a car the suv and you see her like sitting in the back seat and you're like is that guys is that her your friends look at her and look at you and like oh my god that is her so you're waving at her rolling down your window trying to get her attention and you're in the border patrol line so you're trying not to like get out or make a big scene but you're still trying to get their attention your girlfriend is not being responsive at all she's just sitting there kind of sitting down sitting face forward not moving and so you notice something's off like something's definitely wrong you haven't heard from her what is happening you can't do anything to get her attention, so you finally alert the Border Patrol guards and you say, hey, that truck has my girlfriend in there. You know, she went missing a few days ago. You know, you got to go check it out. So they do. They go over. They check out the car, <clears throat> and they pull her out of the car, and they bring everyone else out of the car, too. When they pull her out of the car, they realize she's dead, and her entire body is filled with drugs. She's been She's been killed and everything in her has been removed and they've just filled her with drugs to get her across the border. One of the worst stories. There are currently 2,331 U.S. inmates waiting to be put to death. The average length of time a prisoner is on death row is 16 years. Here's what the last 24 hours before execution look like. Around 8 o'clock on the night prior to execution, the prisoner is taken from their cell to a cell closer to the execution chamber. This room is known as the death house. When asked about this trip, one security guard said, it's very somber. He said, quote, we all know where they're going and we all know why. At nine o'clock, it's lights out, although most prisoners will say that they spent this time not sleeping, but reflecting. At 4.30 the next morning is their final wake up call. Prisoners can spend the next few hours with family, the chaplain, or making phone calls. At 8 a.m., visitors must leave, and the only person the prisoner can speak with is the chaplain or the guards. At 10.30 a.m., lunch is served, and they will typically eat whatever the rest of the prison is eating. From 10.30 to 3, they can read or self-reflect. If they're being put to death by electric chair, they'll get their hair shaved at 3 p.m. This allows for the electrical current to pass through their body easily. At 4 p.m. is dinner or their final meal. Some states will allow the prisoner a $15 budget to pick whatever they want. Other states say you're eating whatever the rest of the prison's eating. At 5 p.m., the executioner and the witnesses begin to arrive. Somewhere between 6 and 8 p.m., the prisoner is brought from their cell to the execution chamber. 15 minutes prior, the lethal injection is prepared, and since it's against the code of ethics for a doctor to execute a person, there is a group of people who are trained to execute. Minutes prior, the curtains are open so the witnesses can see into the execution room. Two minutes prior, the inmate is given an opportunity to say at last words, but this varies state to state. In some states, like Kentucky, the prisoners allowed up to two minute statement. In other states, like Pennsylvania, it has to be a written statement. And in other states, the inmate is given no opportunity to speak. The staff will typically wait one minute past the execution time to give the governor, who is the only person allowed to grant clemency, a chance to call if they want to stop the execution. If after one minute they have not gotten a call from the governor's office, they move forward with the execution.